you know this guy? He lacks consistent self-confidence. He has a slight tilt toward pessimistic, but he has this quiet hope. He's reluctant about tomorrow for fear that something might spoil the day, but he tries his best today. He's more acquainted with losing than winning, and sometimes he's uncharacteristically self-assertive despite his often nervousness. Do you know that guy? Charles Schultz says that his name is Charlie Brown. The lovable loser with the zigzag t-shirt. This past week, I was going through my dad's library, and I came across this book. It says, The Wisdom of Charlie Brown. And in the foreword, it says, In these topsy-turvy times, when the world seems upside down, nothing makes things quite so clear as the wisdom of Charlie Brown. And so I began to leaf through this, and I came across Charlie Brown's wisdom on problem solving. So Linus and Charlie Brown are having a conversation and Linus says to Charlie, look, Charlie Brown, you have fears and you have frustrations. Am I right? He doesn't give him any opportunity to respond and Linus continues, says, of course I'm right. So what you need is a blanket like this to soak up those fears and frustrations. Charlie Brown responds, I don't know. Pauses for a second, then he says, I think that most of life's problems are too complicated to be solved with a spiritual blotter. Church, you know as well as Charlie Brown knows that there is no blanket, there's no material, there's no, not even a handkerchief that's going to take away all of life's problems. Life's problems will be solved by traveling through them with a real-life application of our faith and relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Today, we begin a new series entitled Real Life App, Lessons for Jesus Living. Because it's not about acquiring more information. If you've come here this morning to acquire more biblical information, that is not what we're after We're not even after trying to help you memorize what you believe and being able to recite it back to someone who doesn't. What we've come here is to receive practical insights in our mind that have life implications. They have application ability. Applicability, right? Application ability. There you go. Applicability. I'm learning on the fly here. You didn't know I could teach myself English as we go through this, right? So we're looking at this idea of real life application. This idea of applying the wisdom of God and living out the creeds that we confess. And so I began to look through the Bible and I think, where are some wisdom in the Bible? And I began to read some of these passages, and I came across all of these passages, and I want to read them to you quickly. And we're not going to actually talk about them, but I want to share them with you as wisdom that can be lived out in our life. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that in the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. That sounds good, right? How about this one? If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. I like that one too. How about this? Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position, but the rich should take pride in their humiliation, since they will pass away like a wild flower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plants. Its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. Another one. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trials because having stood the test, that person will receive a crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift comes from God above 
who does not change like shifting shadows. And it continues, the, the wisdom continues and continues. Those who consider themselves religious yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves, and the religion is worthless. That's some good wisdom, right? How about the last one? Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Listen, all of that is good wisdom. Guess what? All of that is found in the same book of the Bible. And not only the same book of the Bible, it's all found in the same chapter. That's all found in James chapter 1. James, the book of James is probably the most practical, applicable book of the entire Bible. And so we want to take some weeks and look at this idea of real life app. Lessons for Jesus living. And our text this next month will be the book of James. Now the book of James is, is written to scattered believers who, like maybe you and I, desire to know how to do this Jesus living thing. Right? They are believers they are ones who have made a confession to Christ. They desire for him to be their Lord and Savior, but they still desire to know how to live it out, the Jesus living thing. And so I think we have opportunity to just kind of look and peek in and overhear what James is saying to his friends in this book of the Bible. And it begins in James chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. James 1, 5 through 8, we overhear James telling the readers, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and if it will be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all he does. Did you catch that there? We serve a God who desires to give us wisdom. And that we need to recognize that we lack wisdom. And he says that if we lack wisdom, we must believe that God will give us wisdom. Because here's the result if you don't believe. He says you're double-minded. And what that means is that you are at war with yourself. How many, don't raise your hand, how many of us understand the reality of that? You have war within yourself. That's what it means to be double-minded. You have this good and you have this bad. And you have this war going on. And guess what happens with that war that's within yourself? You're unstable in all that you do. That's the whole Jesus living part. That's why so often victory is so far reaching for us and how it's so, it eludes us so often in the Jesus living thing. Living as we ought to live is because we're unstable in all that we do. And so James is saying, listen, you don't have to be that way. You didn't realize that Charlie Brown was in the Bible. Charlie Brown is verse 8 of James chapter 1. He's double-minded, and he's unstable in all that he does. I mean, come on, right? Lucy's holding the football, right? And what happens? Right? He's like, is she going to hold it? Is she not going to hold it? And she, you know what I mean? He's, she, he's unstable in all that he does. He's double-minded. We're maybe not as far off from Charlie Brown as we would like. <laughs> and so as I look at this entire chapter of chapter 1, and I asked the Lord, Lord, where do you want us to drill down today? We can't necessarily go verse by verse. And so I've decided to drill down in what I believe is an extremely practical topic in most of our lives. And we find it in verse 13, 14, and 15. And that topic is temptation. Let me tell you a story about a research project out of Case Western University. It was a study of radishes and cookies. And so what this scientist did is he got a group of people together and he had them skip one meal and then he put them in a room with a plate of radishes 
and a plate of cookies. And on these, in his, his only instructions were this. I don't want you to eat the cookies. You could have as many or as few radishes as you want. And so he says, as he observed through all of these um, case studies, no one ate the cookies. A few ate the radishes and a few didn't. But what he realized is that when they came out of the research test, many of them had difficulty with intellectual tasks. Many had, many had increased difficulty performing intellectual tasks, a task immediately after the test. And, he, and here's what Dr. Baumeister figured out. Self-control is something that gets used up and needs time to get replenished before you use it again. I found that very, very interesting. And guess what? What that means about self-control is it's unreliable. Because you don't know if you used it all up, and if you have another encounter that requires self-control, you're more likely to get messed up. Self-control is unreliable. And so if you feel like the way that you're going to deal with temptation, the way you're going to deal with the things that come against you that are pulling you in a different direction, is that you're just going to have self-control, church, it's unreliable. It's going to let you down at some point. You may say, well, listen, I am really strong in this area. But we know that in most cases, in all cases, there are areas where we're not as strong. And that our self-control isn't as effective. And so victory over temptation is not a matter of willpower. I want you to know that today. So if your strategy was temptation to this point in your life has been, I'm just going to overcome it with willpower, I'm betting you got some stories to tell me. Some stories to tell me about failure. And missing the mark. So let's establish a few truths before we really start diving in and running through this. Number one, God is good. Amen? Anybody denying that? All right. So God is good. Number two, God allows trials and temptations. You believe that? So God is good. And God allows trials and temptations. If we have that as an understanding, we can go forward. Because we do believe that God is good, and we do believe that he allows trials and temptations in order to grow up us, grow up, us up in our faith and allow us to experience God in new ways. Stephen Cole, a pastor in Arizona, has written some great material on this passage. And he says that if we are going to overcome temptation, if we're going to overcome temptation, we must recognize its source, its force, and its course, its source, its force, and its course. Because what we see immediately in this passage, go back with me to James 1.13. And we say that when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. See, what we see here immediately from the beginning of this passage is that these folks that are being tempted are immediately shifting the blame. They're immediately saying that I'm not responsible for what I'm doing. It's God making me do that. When, when did we hear that last? Maybe was that, was that Adam that said that in the garden? What did he say when God came looking and said, did you eat that apple? And he said what? Yeah, that was that woman you gave me. The woman you gave me. He basically said, listen, I didn't deal well with my temptation, but it's your fault, God. And that's exactly what James is saying in chapter, thir of chapter 1 of verse 13. He's saying, listen, that, that, that stop saying that God is the one that's tempting you. Because God is not the one that's tempting you. The source of your temptation is you. Your temptation comes from our own sinful and evil desires. Now we all have desires. We all have lusts. Uh, that's the negative form of desire. But we all have these passions and desires. And some of them are healthy and some of them are not. And James is using the same word for trials and temptation. 
Because he knows that there are some things, listen, listen, there are some things in our life that are trials. There are things that you go through in your life that God definitely wants you to go through in order to strengthen up your faith, to pull out the genuineness of your faith, to refine your faith. But there are other things that are temptations that are not of God. He may allow them, but they are actually to pull out the worst in you. Amen? There are things that God desires to have you go through in life that are supposed to pull out the best in you. And you're supposed to persevere through those things. But there are no doubt things in our lives that we experience that are squarely meant to pull out the worst of who we are. And he says in verse 13, God cannot be tempted by evil. Because it is very, God's very nature. In verse John 1, 5, God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. God is not your tempter. God is not the one that is subjecting you to temptation. He's allowing it, but it is not he who is doing it to you. The temptation is that we are fallen beings. We are people that have within us sinful and evil desires. And can I be honest with you today? So often we talk about how we fall into sin. Oh, man, how did I do that again? Man. But the reality is, the honest part is that great many of us make plans to sin. We make plans for disaster ahead of time. Let me give you an example. A little boy. And his father were having a conversation. He said, listen, uh, Dad, I want to go swimming in the canal. And the dad said, no, I don't want you to swim in the canal. And so dad says, okay, um, but come home. Uh, so he says, here, let me start over again because I'm a really bad storyteller. Let's try that again. Ready? Um, so basically the kid wants to go and he wants to swim in the canal. And the dad says, listen, I don't want you to swim in the canal, but I, where, and so he goes away and he doesn't think he's swimming in the canal, but he comes back and the boy is carrying a wet swimming suit in the evening. And the father says, where have you been? Swimming in the canal, he says. Didn't I tell you not to swim, the father asked. He said, yes, sir. Why did you do it? Well, dad, I had my bathing suit with me and I couldn't resist the temptation. And the father says, why did you take your bathing suit with you? And the boy responded, so I would be prepared to swim in case I was tempted. Isn't that how we, isn't that, like, we prepare sometimes to sin. We, we prepare sometimes. Let's try this better and see if I can do better on this one. A little boy's mother had just baked a fresh batch of cookies and placed them in the cookie jar. And she gave instructions like many of you have in the past. No one is to touch these until after dinner. But not long after she gave those instructions, she heard the lid of the jar being moved. And she called out, my son, what are you doing? To which a meek voice called back, my hand is in the cookie jar resisting temptation. <laughs> See, here's the thing. That would be hilarious if it wasn't true. So often, we have our hands in cookie jars all throughout our life, and we're wondering why we're failing, at, we're failing against temptation. What? Right? No one can resist temptation when he is, his or her hand is in the cookie jar. There are open cookie jars all around us inviting us to taste. Too many of us expect to sin and constantly placing ourselves in its proximity. If we truly want to overcome, let's look at Romans 13, 14. It says, rather clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, church, listen, wake up. He will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. God wants you to overcome. God will permit 
uh, temptation to come into your life. And it will be difficult. But the scriptures tell us that he will provide a way out each and every time. So we must first understand the source of temptation. Number two, the, the force of temptation. The reason why temptation is so powerful is because it dwells within our hearts. Look at, with me at chapter 1, verse 14. What's it say there? But each one is tempted when by what? His own evil desires he is dragged away and enticed. It is not God. It is our own beings. And the imagery here is, and I'm not a fisherman, but, but here's the imagery, and I think it works. The imagery is the bait in the hook. The bait in the hook is that those fish, they see something that looks enticing to them, but really in the end, it hooks them. The fish see the bait, and they're lured towards it, thinking of a specific outcome. They're thinking that that is the next meal, but in the end, it, they turn out to be the meal. Amen? Amen? That is the imagery that James is using in this passage to talk about how our, our sinful desires, our s desires, our passions have a way of enticing us and dragging us, hooking us away. Their desire, the fish's desire for the bait is, is so intense that it causes them to lose caution. Hello, hello, right? The bait and the desire for the bait is so intense, it causes us to, them to lose caution and to overlook or ignore the hook until it's too late. James even goes further. James explains that the force of temptation is so strong that it actually has the ability to conceive and give birth to things in our life. To each one is tempted when by his own evil desires he is dragged away and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. That's the force of temptation. I had a 1989 Cavalier when I was in seminary. And uh, we were really, well, I was, yeah, so I'll save that part. But anyways, so we didn't have a lot of money. So we were driving this 90, 1989 Cavalier. And it was so nasty. And it had such, so many leaks that it literally had a plant growing in the floorboard of the passenger seat. Literally. I mean, there was like, it was sprouting something in the floorboard. I mean, that's the power. Like, there was no soil. There was no fertilizer. It literally, the, the seed somehow got on someone's, from someone's foot, actually got into that environment, and it began to grow. Church, just because you're not somewhere where it typically happens, or, or it obviously that happens when you go there. Listen, we know that temptation has a force, and it's powerful in our life. And it may not line up with everything, but we know that when there is a seed and there is an environment, things can grow anywhere. And so I want you to know that temptation is not to be messed around with. And guess what? Knowledge does not seem to prevent us from yielding to temptation. Just because you love God and you've read the Bible cover to cover for the last 10 years doesn't make you exempt from temptation. And frankly, when you know the outcome of temptation, that knowledge doesn't stop you from entering the temptation either. So to say that knowledge prevents us from temptation is inaccurate because of the force of temptation. It's within us, it's powerful, and it's an emotional part of our being. So the source, the force, number three, the course. People always wonder how they ended up where they're at. No one ever falls into temptation and sin. It's actually a pretty lengthy journey. I read a story this week of a man who was wanted some coffee. 
and he was on a diet. And so he said, listen, uh, I know I'm on this diet, but I really feel like a cup of coffee would really hit the spot. And, and here's what I'll do, God. Uh, I'll drive down, and if there's a parking spot at the donut shop, I'll pull in. And that'll be a sign to me from you that I'm allowed to have a donut and a cup of coffee even on my diet. And he says, wouldn't you, wouldn't you know that there was a spot right in the front of the coffee shop on my seventh time around? <laughs> People wonder why they get places that they end up. It's because they keep circling it. They keep circling it and circling it and circling it. Listen, we're not falling into this stuff. James lays it out very clearly in verses 14 and 15. See the progression. It starts with a desire. Then it moves to a temptation. Then it moves into a sin. Then it becomes a habit. And eventually, in verse 15, where does it end? Death. And he's not talking, he's not talking about like physical death. It may end up there. He's talking about when start, things start dying in your life. When your wife doesn't want to hang around the house anymore. And she starts serving papers. He, he's talking about when, when, you, when your kids don't want to have a relationship with you anymore. That's when things start dying. That's what the progression is. You say, well, it's just, Pastor, it's really just this little thing in my life right now. But trust me, there is a progression, and it ends up in bad places. It ends up in death. Things die. You're thinking, man, I came to church for encouragement, Kat. Why are you, in, why are you discouraging me? I'm just trying to tell you the truth. Can, can we be honest today? Can we talk about a real life app? Can we talk about how we try to get this off these pages and into our heart and in our lives? We're not talking about perfection here. We're not talking about getting it all right. We're just trying to talk about being real. We're talking about grace, which I'm about to get to in a second. We're talking about forgiveness. We're talking about love. But we're also talking about temptation and desire and sin. And death. Because if we're going to be real, we can't just talk about grace. Because nobody needs grace if there's no sin. Nobody needs mercy if no one's doing anything wrong. We got to talk about the beginning in order to understand the significance of that. That has no value if you all are perfect. And I know this isn't um, whatever. I don't, I mean, whatever the term people want to use is this. This isn't seeker sensitive. Or, uh, it's real. This is the real life application. This is about taking your relationship with Christ from the altar out into the community. I mean, come on. Temptation, it always promises us something different, something exciting, something fulfilling. I mean, come on. When you, in your mind, when you're dealing with this stuff, I almost said that bad word again. I was going to say the C word. Um, crap. Um, when, when you're dealing with that stuff, it never says to you, would you like to destroy your family? Who, would you like to disgrace your God? No, what does it say? It's enticing you. This will be fun. This will meet your needs. This will get you what you have always been looking for. It won't hurt. Just try it. But I want to tell you the truth today. Although there's a progression to sin, there's also a progression to life. F.P. Wood says it this way. Temptation is not sin. It's a call to battle. So I don't know if you've ever heard a preacher that got on you and told you you were going to hell because you were tempted. He's going to hell for lying. Being tempted is not a sin. It's a call to battle. 
that war within our soul it is not a momentary skirmish on the playground. It is a soul war. John Quincy Adams, every temptation is an opportunity for, of our getting nearer to God. Martin Luther said it this way in talking about the, what the flesh means for evil, God can use for good. He says, my temptations have been my masters in divinity. Shoot, I probably have like 16 doctorates then. He says that my temptation have been my masters in divinity. Temptation and adversity are the two best books in my library. He's saying, listen, that if we are able to overcome those things that the enemy brings into our life, it brings us closer to God. It strengthens our faith. It allows us to be victorious. Church, please do not confuse your position from your practice. People say, well, listen, I, Pastor, last night I did this and this and this and this and this wrong. My question to you first is, are we talking about your position with Christ or your practicing out of Christ? Because your position in Christ is that you have got forgiveness of your sins. You are under the blood of Jesus Christ. Your practice kind of stinks. And so, please, we are not talking about your salvation if you have come here today and you can declare Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you've asked him to come into your life and you've asked him to do something new in your life, you are a child of God. And you are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. But the practice is that our sin nature, our flesh man, is powerful and still resides in our bodies. It has not been eradicated and it will not be eradicated until you go to heaven. We can have victory over it. We can have power over it. It's no, we are no longer a slave to it, but it doesn't mean that it's gone. This is still who we are. Overcoming temptation is important to realize that although the initial thought to sin stems from our sinful flesh, it is not sin unless I pursue it. So God-honoring progression, temptation, faith, Obedience, perseverance, life. That's the temptation, progression that we need to follow as believers. Temptation, everyone has it, everyone experiences it. Then our faith kicks in that the devil is a liar and everything he's selling me right now is not true. That's our faith. And then we obey the way that God would want us to obey. We persevere through the difficult times and we receive life. That's the progression of life. Let's try to bring this in for a landing. I want to bring several scriptures to, to your mind. And you want to, might just want to mark them down because we're going to go quickly through them. But I want you to see them and see the truth of them as we wind this passage down. James 1, 2 through 4. Let's go back, and now it'll have so much more significance as we read it again. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials. Same word for trials and temptations. The Greek word there, um, para, P-A-R-A-O-X. Um, it's the same word for trials and temptations. Because you... Um, Face trials of many kinds because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance and perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Church, that's one of the things that we happen that comes out of this. Psalm 119, 29 and 30. Keep me from de deceitful ways. Be gracious to me and teach me your law. I have chosen the way of faithfulness. Church, today we need to declare that we choose faithfulness. And I have set my hearts on your laws. Hebrews 4, 16. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. John 17, 17. Sanctify or make me holy or make me perfect by the truth. Your word is the truth. Church, I know it sounds churchy. I know it sounds like something you hear from a preacher. But the more that we get this in this, the less power temptation has in our life. Bishop Hanlon, Hamlin, not Hanlon, not Earl. Earl's not a bishop. Bishop Hamlin 
says it this way. Pray from God's side of the fence. Think about that for a second. Where do you find yourself most praying? Is it on God's side of the fence or are you most desperate when you're in the devil's garden? We find ourselves most passionately praying to God, dear God, help me get out of here because we're on the wrong side of the fence. We're in the devil's garden and we're praying and we're pleading and we're desperate. This bishop says, listen, pray on God's side of the fence. God will help you. And keep you on his side and watch and pray that you not enter into temptation. I had someone recently tell me as I was explaining some of the difficulties that I have in my life. She said to me, you need to get a riskier hobby. Because what you want is you want a thrill. You want, a, you want fun. You want excitement. You get bored easily. You need to find a riskier hobby. Maybe the thing is you need to find some riskier hobbies. If you are not, if you're constantly chasing after temptation, chasing after all these things, you need a riskier hobby. Take up like bungee jumping or something. Something that's not going to lead to death. (laughs) Your family will speak well of you at your funeral. C.S. Lewis in closing. Have I said closing like 16 times? Did someone say yes? Yes. How rude. Just a man trying to preach. C.S. Lewis. Thank you, brother. From one reverend to the other. <laughs> My collar's getting tighter. C.S. Lewis said it this way. Give, 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 me, give me three minutes. C.S. Lewis said it this way. Uh, worship team, come back. You can save me. C.S. Lewis made these insightful observations about temptation. Listen to this. He says, no man knows how bad he is until he has tried very hard to be good. I, that makes so much sense to me. If you're here today and you're thinking, man, I don't really, I don't, I don't really struggle with anything. I'm afraid you're too far in to know. (laughs) No man knows how bad he is, and I would like to change that. Uh, No man knows how desperate he is for the grace and mercy of God until he has tried very hard to be good on his own. Church, let me remind you, temptation is not a sin. We do not fall into temptation. God is not disappointed or displeased when we are tempted. We need to realize that we can overcome temptation. Know yourself. Know your vulnerabilities. Know how God has designed you. Avoid those tempting situations. Predetermine your commitment to follow Christ. And always remember the gruesome end to temptation.